Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us again for this final episode of our fun and fascinating monitoring report support project. Um, we've had a series of workshops uh, identifying good reporting techniques that we've learned from a number of different managers, tying those ideas to the specific CBUILD policies, and presenting a set of template reports. After today, um, you will see these two reports posted uh, with this recording, um, but we'll also be compiling all the template reports into one easy-to-use, easy-to-download resource. We encourage you to check that out. Um, I'm going to present a quick overview of the whole project here to start with. Uh, we're going to then uh, introduce the last two reports, the uh, GM emergency GM succession report and then the global executive limitations report. Um, then we will be getting a special presentation um, from Joel Brock, who will do a quick uh, introduction to uh, easy ways to, to use graphs in your reports, um, as you'll see in some of the reports in the project. Uh, showing graphical information is a great way to help boards see the big picture. So uh, just real quick, I want to, um, again, introduce the whole project to you um, and take you through what this, uh, what we've done. So we started um, way back uh, this spring by inviting a number of different uh, managers to uh, share with us their reports, um, things that have been working for them and for their boards, and looking at that for examples of uh, these kinds of qualities. Um, overall, what we're looking for in monitoring is something that, that demonstrates these clear lines of accountability, that the manager is able to be accountable to the board, and the board has enough information where they feel like they can, in turn, be accountable to their member owners. Um, so that's, that's the overarching goal in a, in a democratically controlled cooperative. Um, very specifically, there's a relationship between the board as the employer and the GM as the employee. And the monitoring reports are a major part of developing that relationship between the board and the GM. Um, we're trying to also look for I, ways that managers um, really do account in, in ways that demonstrate that they are using the authority that, that he or she has been given by the board um, and that the board is comfortable with the GM's use of that authority. Um, fourth, that the directors individually and the board as a whole, um, again, have enough information that they can speak to the member owners as a, as a group or as individuals. Um, saying, yes, we, we do use this system, this model, where we've delegated a lot of authority to our general manager. But in fact, we are still aware of what's going on. We do know what's happening here. Um, and lastly, really a benefit to the manager. Uh, hopefully, it's a motivator to encourage good reports, um, but also makes the board's uh, work that much easier. These monitoring reports form the basis of the annual GM evaluation. We want those reports really to be dynamite, showing all the great stuff that our managers are doing. Some quick ideas here as you're looking at these template reports. You may or may not want to use exactly what's in the template. No matter what you do, we want to encourage uh, managers to approach monitoring uh, with a few techniques in mind. Um, first off, that the definitions, the interpretations within these reports are not something that you need to uh, or should be spending time developing just by yourself as a manager. Um, these uh, ideas were developed in conjunction with many other uh, people involved. And you, yourself as a manager, can turn to your own management team, uh, make sure everyone involved in the co-op understands the definitions, the interpretations, and is aligned in their use. Um, as with many things, uh, but in particular these reports, this is not work that gets done best if it's done just the week before the report is due, that the process of defining the policies, interpreting them, creating the measure, measurements, this is something that really should start as soon as the ink is dry on the policy itself, um, that you set up all the systems 
uh, the data collection, all the measurements, those get set up early on in the process. And the last bit at the very end of writing the report is really the least bit of it. Uh, but all that other good hard work is done way in advance. Um, in terms of interpreting policy, we encourage folks to start with um, the most detailed part of the policy, the, the sub-policies. Um, work on interpreting those and then build your interpretations, your definitions up and out as you approach the global part of whatever the policy is. I mean, you'll see a good example of that in, in when we do the global executive limitation policy report this afternoon. Um, the plan for collecting the data, uh, keeping track of the data is something that happens, as I said, uh, early on. And in all these reports, um, not stuffing them full of extraneous excess information, but occasionally having some background or educational information that does help a director who's reading this report understand it. Um, and throughout the series, you'll see some examples of that. This project, this, uh, as I introduced it at the very beginning of the process, we're trying to help GMs have uh, an efficient and effective process for creating their own reports. These templates are based on uh, a half dozen or so samples from managers around the country who are being successful in this um, and based on what our CBUILD team has been learning and work with boards all over the country. Within the reports, this is what we're looking for. Do they demonstrate reasonable accountability? that creating them is not an overly difficult part of the manager's job, um, that the interpretations, the definitions, the content of the report is easy for a director, a lay director, like most of our co-op directors, to understand, and that the data itself is not hard to put together. So in each of the reports, not only we're we looking for reasonable interpretations, but then interpretations that lend themselves to a relatively easy collection of data. I introduced this set of graphs at the very beginning of the project. Um, this was based on some survey work that our CDS Consulting Co-op did this spring. And this is not um, a scientific uh, cause and effect statement, but it is a correlation that does seem to lend itself to, to supporting the work we're doing here. That when boards and managers um, responded to our survey that they had a productive relationship, there's a pretty strong correlation between that and whether they thought the manager was effectively communicating ends progress. Now this project uh, is focused on the limitations reports, not the ends reports. There's the sister project that Mark Goring led. You should check out the ends samples and that uh, online recorded workshop. Uh, but again, just thinking about how effective communication is a big part of the productive relationship. Um, and here are the seven managers who specifically shared their reports um, with us. And I want to thank them and encourage any managers who are looking in on this um, and checking out the templates to consider these managers here as experts who you could go and ask their um, ideas um, or look for their uh, suggestions in your own reporting. So th that introduction, I want to um, just very uh, quickly go through the two um, monitoring report templates that we've got going today. We're going to start with the um, B9. The, the, the numbers, the letters here are um, attached uh, or, or related to our CBUILD policy template. Um, and you can check those out. The, uh, in our CBUILD library, the policies themselves. If your board's policy doesn't exactly align with the CBUILD policies, that's really not a problem. These, these reports still include a lot of information, a lot of uh, sample ideas that you could pick and choose from and plop them right down in your own reports where they do relate to your board's policy. Um, in this, uh, I'm going to show you a few things that I thought were really um, either interesting or, or important to keep in mind as you're putting together your own uh, report. Much of it, the formatting, the presentation is very similar to the other reports, so I'll try not to repeat things that you would have learned or heard in the other online recorded workshops. Uh, to start with, this, this policy is really 
um, a board's way of saying to the manager, please make sure that um, you know if you if the aliens come and take you away, manager, we want to make sure that there's someone in the co-op who can still just keep things going while we look for another GM. So we aren't necessarily looking for um, the general manager of a co-op to, to to name his or her own successor, um, but just someone who could take over in the interim. This report is written uh, as if there is just one um, designated uh, interim manager. There are some boards who look for two uh, designated interim managers, or a first and a second, a backup. However your board's policy is written, this I believe this report is formatted in such a way that you could easily incorporate those ideas. But again, we're just going to go through assuming there's this is a policy about one interim. Um, let's see here in the definitions. What you'll notice um, is that in this set of operational definitions, the first one is just very straightforward, that the manager will identify who the successor, the interim designated general manager is. But then you'll see three definitions that have to do with how the board um, and manager relate to each other. So there are three things about the, this interim person relating to the board, and then there are three things about this interim person and their ability to take care of operations. Um, we will get into the data associated with each of those in just a moment. One of the pieces of data that I found very interesting um, when I looked uh, at these samples, um, Tim Bartlett um, of Lexington Co-op and uh, someone who wasn't participating in the project but whose report I saw, Sarah Leberts at Common Market, both are using this confidence of ability survey. And I encourage you to, if you're looking to maybe incorporate this uh, technique into your own reporting, um, to talk with one of those two managers and, and see how they're formatting uh, their survey and how you might use some of their ideas in your own work. Um, but the survey is a, is a way of getting this designated interim manager to uh, report on their own how they how ready they are for uh, the successor role. So from those definitions, then the data. And again, as we mentioned in the introduction to this whole project, the data really writes itself. Um, so what you'll see is some interesting formatting ideas, but the data is driven by those operational definitions and those definitions hopefully you are creating and, and deciding on very early on in this process. So uh, I'm not going to read through each of these, but you'll see very, um, very clean, crisp presentation in tabular form uh, related to each of the operational definitions above, showing who the designated person is, uh, when they, what kind of training they got, when they attended board meetings, when they've led management team meetings, whatever they might have done. Um, so there's all the different trainings they've gotten. Um, and here is a sampling of some of the qualities that uh, the two managers who were doing the confidence of ability survey were including in their report. Um, again, this survey, I'm not sure these are necessarily the right, the, the, the exact uh, qualities that you would include in yours, but I thought they were really nice examples um, taken from those two managers' reports. There you have it. It's a very straightforward report based on the C-Build um, policy. Uh, as I said before, if you have um, a policy that looks a little bit different, uh, there's a fair chance that much of what's in here you could use still in your own reporting. So B9, emergency GM succession, that's the last of the specific executive limitations that we currently include in our C-Build uh, policy register template. What we then have is, if you go back to what I mentioned earlier, um, starting with the sub-policies and then building uh, your definitions, your interpretations, your data with each sub-policy, and then eventually getting back to the uh, global policy. So this um, policy, let's see if I can get to the top of the page here. Um, here we go. This policy uh, is the global B policy. Um, you hopefully would have 
reported on each of the sub-policies, the B1 in this case through B9 throughout the course of the year. And now is the chance to say, okay, is there anything in this global policy that I'd want to report on that I haven't already reported on throughout the rest of the year? Um, so this is a very uh, broad brush kind of policy. It's, a, it's the catch-all, the final net to make sure nothing has gotten missed. Um, there may be specific events that happen during the course of the year that a board or a manager might refer to, but in general, um, I found some really nice ways that managers are reporting on this. Um, the first is to um, acknowledge at the very beginning, um, I, I found this in uh, um, one or two of the manager's reports. I thought it was really nice uh, ideas to start off by saying essentially the manager recognizes that um, the manager it, uh, is responsible for everything operationally, but is not necessarily responsible for the governance functions of the co-op, that that's really the board's responsibility. Um, so this report is not meant to um, cover the board's own policies about its own behavior. Um, a good distinction, a good clarification. Uh, second, um, in this paragraph of the interpretation, um, relaying from the manager to the board saying, I believe that in general your sub-policies are uh, a sufficient definition of the global policy and those sub-policies, meaning B1, B2, all the, the one we just looked at, B9, executive succession, GM succession, that those policies really are sufficiently um, defining this global policy and the data and the interpretations in those reports will do. So I'm not going to repeat everything in this global report, but really let's look for specific things that aren't covered elsewhere. And so the manager here in this template is saying that the two things that really aren't covered sufficiently uh, in the sub-policies, the, the uh, detailed executive limitations, are information about lawfulness and about the operating within the, the bounds of the cooperative principles. Here you'll see an example of a little bit of that uh, educational material that I uh, have found to be very helpful in some of the reports I saw. Um, a little paragraph here from Ann Hoyt's excellent article about the cooperative principles, since we're going to talk about those in this policy. Um, again, not trying to put the whole article in, not trying to dump a lot of information, but just some high-level, um, high very important ideas here for the board to consider as they're reading this report. Um, and then making this distinction, um, I really liked how a couple managers uh, said this in a variety of ways, but saying that uh, the cooperative principles are talking about the means um, and that we're going to focus on um, being a cooperative by following the cooperative principles, but by being our particular cooperative by working towards our ends. Um, and so we would look to that ends report for, for that, that real exciting stuff about what makes our co-op special, but just to be a co-op in general, we'll follow the cooperative principles. So with that in mind, then we get into four very straightforward definitions, um, and you'll notice that back at the top we uh, put the uh, monitoring summary report table um, that uh, was used also in another of the policy uh, reports, the, the one about um, GM getting information to the board, keeping the board informed, we use the same table as part of our data. So that's attached here, and it's essentially just showing that the, there's information that the board has accepted the other reports, and so that shows overall compliance with this global policy. Um, this particular definition um, is written in such a way that the manager um, would not be out of compliance with the global policy every time there was a minor issue of non-compliance in one of the other policies. And uh, saying to the board, if you accepted my plan for reaching compliance in some of those other policies, that shows that I'm in compliance here. Um, and that just, again, saves us from having to identify uh, this policy as out of compliance um, because there's going to be an probably several examples of non-compliance with other policies throughout the year. Um, the third uh, definition here, just specifically, um, that 
the manager is saying to the board, I'm telling you all, I will report any known illegal activity to you, um, even if no one else has, uh, has found out about that or has, has sued us or fined us. So basically, the, the board is saying two things. One is, essentially, we're in compliance with the law. If no one else has told us we're out of compliance with the law, that we're doing something illegal. But I will make sure as a manager that if I, if I see something that's, that's illegal, I will let you all know. I'm going to keep you informed. Very important. Um, way to build a healthy relationship with a manager. And then the data is very, very simple here, very straightforward, mostly because I'm not trying to make up stories in this sample of possible um, fines that a co-op might have received. Uh, but if you did, you would report them here. So the first bit of data is the monitoring summary table itself, hopefully showing that you had re actually submitted uh, and the board had accepted all those other monitoring reports and especially if you're using these great templates here there should be that shouldn't be a question um, second definition how what were we fined what, did we get sued as a co-op in the past uh, year um, in this case I'm just saying none but if there were fines or there were lawsuits um, certainly report them here Thirdly, did we have any illegal activity that the GM knows about, and did we want to report that to the board? Again, this is um, a, a special um, and important part of the GM's keeping the board informed. And fourth, and here's the most interesting part of the data here, is where the manager um, reports on how did we actually live up to the cooperative principles in a way that demonstrates we are a cooperative or a particular kind of business. Um, there were a couple different ways that managers reported on this. Um, this format here, the table with uh, on one column showing what the cooperative principle was. There's the seven principles from the ICA uh, making an operational definition and or interpretation. Uh, to let the board know how you're thinking about this as a manager, and then the data. Um, and, the, and again, the data, this is not very complex uh, rocket science kind of stuff. This is, this is just, these are the fundamental things we do. So um, how do we demonstrate that we have voluntary and open membership? Well, look at our bylaws, look at our articles of incorporation. Um, and uh, this little uh, note here, um, here's all these people who have joined and withdrawn during the past year, and nobody has claimed that that was not voluntary. So there's some evidence there. I'm not going to go through each of these in detail, um, but just so you can see, this is presented in tabular form, again, just because it helps organize the data. Um, and so it makes for a really big uh, table, but it also is a very clear presentation, going through each of the principles uh, with some definitions and some data, some evidence of how we operate as a co-op member economic participation. Autonomy and independence. Here's one, again, where the manager included some educational material, quoting, again, from Ann Hoyt's article about the cooperative principles. Um, and I think this, uh, when I saw this, I thought it was very helpful, in large part because this particular principle is often, I find, misunderstood by directors and managers alike. Um, and so to remind us what the point of the, the principle of autonomy and independence is. It doesn't mean we can't enter into relationships with NCGA or other co-ops, um, but that we do that from an autonomous position, not controlled by other larger entities. Uh, the fifth principle of education and training, I just, uh, as I looked at some of the reports here, I realized that um, this, uh, I would hope that this information about education um, is included in your ENDS reporting, um, assuming that there's anything about education uh, or knowledge uh, in your board's ENDS. I, because I see that so often, uh, my guess is um, most managers can and should be reporting on education in the ENDS report. And so if you've done that, you wouldn't necessarily need to repeat it here. If you haven't done that, uh, then you would put that information in this report. Um, one of the things that uh, it occurred to me as I was looking at this presentation, um, have you as a manager uh, reminded the board that their own education is part of the cooperative principles? So could you include that information here, what kind of training the board has gotten either in this report or again in the ENDS report? Um, 
six principal cooperation. This is just one example that uh, most of you all who are reading these sample reports are part of the NCGA. Um, but if there are other uh, organizations that you're a part of, this could be a place to mention it. Um, and the seventh principle, concern for community. Again, uh, I would hope that your ENDS report is really the place where you are identifying from the board's perspective as, on behalf of the owners what, what concerns do we have for the community and how have we addressed those. Um, so rather than trying to, uh, in this report, in this limitations report, rather than trying to focus a lot of time and attention on, on a long laundry list of, of activities, remind the board that, hey, we are concerned for our community and we show that through our work on our ends. So again, a very straightforward presentation of what can uh, sometimes be, be thought of as a very complicated kind of policy, but we are looking at um, the global limitation in the context of remembering that we've reported on this throughout the year uh, in lots of smaller ways uh, through the other policy reports. So I just want to check real quick before I go on. I always uh, offer the opportunity for participants to ask questions. Um, you can uh, raise your hand by clicking on the hand icon uh, on your um, webinar uh, toolbar there. Um, it doesn't look like we have any questions from the audience. Questions. Great. That means it was a good, clear presentation. Um, so again, I just want to thank the managers who submitted uh, reports uh, as samples, as examples of what's working for them. And my hope is that over time, as more managers use these templates and refine them either even further, uh, in another uh, couple of years, remember we started this project with a set of templates um, several years back. And my hope and, and assumption is that in another few years, we will have even more uh, skilled managers providing more excellent reports, and we can draw on their expertise to develop the next round of templates. Uh, I encourage all of you managers who are looking at these reports to uh, turn to each other uh, as your fellow experts. Find out what's working. Um, so with that, I am finished with the presentation of each of the template reports. Remember, there will be a compilation of all the reports available soon after the project uh, is completed today. You can find that in the CBUILD library by following the GM report support uh, link in, on the home page of the library. Um, Joel, thank you for providing the backup tech uh, support for this. And now I'm very interested to see if you can teach all of us how to uh, include graphs uh, uh, in our reporting. Is that something you're ready to do? Of course. Thank you. Yes. Um, I'm going to switch screens real quick. So, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Joel Brock. I am a tech consultant for CDS Consulting Co-op. I also happen to be a board member uh, at People's Food Co-op in Portland, Oregon. So. Um, I have a bit of both sides of perspective on building reports and then also can just say, uh, can speak to the importance of, of using graphs and using them effectively in your reports, uh, your monitoring reports and your end reports um, because tables full of data, um, while they may tell a more detailed story, um, board members really like graphs. <laughs> But um, but displaying that table that data in a graphical way that makes a lot of sense and tells a story can be really effective and a great addition to your report. So I wanted to show uh, you all a couple different ways to include some simple and effective graphs in your report, specifically in Microsoft Word, uh, and then I'll touch a little bit on building graphs in Excel. Um, but for example, we have this simple sales growth graph uh, showing sales growth against uh, a benchmark. Um, 
And so we're going to just step real quickly through the process of creating a graph like this and uh, customizing it to suit your needs. Um, so we're going to start with a blank document here, and I'm just going to add a graph in really quickly. In Microsoft Word, they make it very simple for us. I'm going to simply place my cursor where I want the graph, and under the Insert tab, I'm just going to insert a chart. Um, now there's lots of options here, but I'm going to stick with a simple line graph for now. And you'll see that it brings up Excel and a little table with some sample data in it. Um, so I'm going to edit this table over here, and we can watch the graph change over here. And uh, I'll show you how we can turn this into a really simple graph like the one we just saw. Um, first, if we look at the Excel table here, uh, we'll see the little blue border. If we resize that, um, we can change how many sets of data we're displaying. So we're just going to show two. Um, so now we've got two columns of data and four rows. And we can rename these. Uh, and you'll see as we do that, that they uh, will update on the chart in Microsoft Word. So let's make Series 2 our benchmark, because it's red. And uh, Series 1 will be our actual data. And then you can see down here in Microsoft Word that the, the data sets have been renamed. Here we can rename uh, the, the labels across our x-axis, and these can be um, years or quarters or whatever makes sense for your particular report. Great. Um, the hard part's done. Now we just need to put in the data. So in our case, uh, let's fill in the benchmark here, and we'll put in some, oh, put in some data, but before we do that, uh, we should set these cells to use the appropriate um, measurement. So if we're doing um, a measurement of dollars, then we would change that to uh, a num uh, integer with two decimal places. Let's do a, a percentage. So we're going to change these fields to percentages. Now we can enter in the percentages. Um, for our benchmark and our actual data. Um, it's easier, actually, if we just clear these out first. So we'll put in you know, 4%. Oops. There we go, 4%. And uh, Put in some numbers here for the sake of demonstration. And those will be our benchmark that we're measuring against. Now we can put in our actual data. In our example here of, of sales growth, we'll put in some realistic numbers like Um, and there, we have created a graph, provided this was all actual data and not made up numbers like mine, um, that tells uh, a very specific and um, important story, namely that the benchmark that the board has set, which is represented by the red line, uh, has not been crossed by the actual performance of the store. And that um, tells our board members that they have but the management is still in compliance. Um, we can further format the graph. Um, any part of it is editable if we just select it and then right click on it. For example, the scale on the side here, we can alter that by formatting the axis. And then you see we can change all kinds of properties. I won't go into it, but uh, also colors, 
you want to change the colors of your uh, your lines on your graph, etc. Um, I will say that it's helpful to have a consistent coloring across all your graphs, as well as consistent formatting, um, meaning uh, using one or two maybe types of graphs, line graphs and bar graphs, or bar graphs and pie charts, but um, trying to stick to a couple uh, effective graphing types and uh, not mixing it up too much. Uh, I'm going to show you in Microsoft Excel uh, another way to do graphing um, that is really effective, especially for your global ends reports, um, reports that have lots of graphs, or if you're collecting a lot of data in a spreadsheet. Um, so I'm just using the Lexington Co-op uh, and uh, data collection worksheet here um, from Tim Bartlett at Lexington in Buffalo. And uh, this is actually available as part of the GM report support um, toolkit on the PBuild library uh, for download. So that's actually just where I got this from. And uh, so here you can see we're collecting a great deal of data. Um, in over, over the course of a couple of years. And so this is a really helpful tool to build graphs off of because you've got all your data in one place. And what you can do, which Tim has done here and is really helpful, is on a separate tab, he's actually created um, a tab with just all of his graphs, all the data that he needs for the report. And in this case, it's actually even organized by global end um, section. So you can see, you know, global uh, education and, and uh, all the global end policies and the charts that are needed for each one. Um, and this is a really great way to do your graph because you've got all your data in this spreadsheet, which you're collecting over time, and you can then. Uh, you can then go back and update these charts for, to include the new data that you're collecting in there. Uh, and then once you have this something like this set up, you can very easily include these in your report um, by simply copying from Excel and then pasting into your report here in Microsoft Word. Um, very simple. And you can see uh, that Tim has restricted himself to uh, a couple colors and a couple styles of graph, um, keeping things really clean and simple and easy to read. They're not overloaded with data. Um, the graphs themselves don't have labels uh, with the values of each one. It's just important that the story be told, not necessarily um, the the numbers to the to the, to the penny, um, and that is something that is being done very successfully here in Tim's um, data collection worksheet. So I encourage you to check this out. You can download it on, as I said, on the Seabuild library, and um, see what some of, some of your other uh, GM compadres are doing. Uh, there's also, uh, I believe, another data collection worksheet that you can look at from another co-op as well. Um, so if anybody had any questions about the simple graphing that I've just demonstrated, feel free to raise your hand and I can answer your questions. Otherwise, um, that is what I wanted to cover. It doesn't look like we do have any questions. So with that, I wanted to say thank you and feel free to check out this recording or Michael's previous recording on the uh, on the Seabuild library. Um, and Michael, did you want to chime in and say goodbye to everybody? Yeah, Joel, thank you. That was great. I, now I can't wait to go and practice my own skills at inserting graphs. Um, thank everybody for your participation, your attention for these projects. These, these report projects. I wish you well as you try to make use of some of these skills. And please do let us know 
what's working for you and for your board, which parts of this project really became useful for you, and if you have suggestions on um, ways that we can improve either the templates or our presentation. So thank you all so much, and I look forward to hearing what you do with all this good stuff next. With that, 